at that point, we just transitioned really solely to the CPG clients, kind of stopped working with a number of the other clients that weren't really related, as well as stopped really development on products that weren't going to facilitate this new model. And that's where things really taken off. Like that focus really changed the trajectory of the company entirely. And like since then, we've pretty much doubled year over year revenue bookings, probably team as well. So kind of that inflection point was really where everything changed for Ad Adapted. The startup investment landscape is changing and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Eric Hornung, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Squash Master himself, Jay Klaus. Jay, how's it going, man? I am a squash novice. I would never claim to be a squash master. I'm calling you a squash master. I think that you would beat me in squash just on the full disclosure I've never played before, so you know the rules. I do feel confident that I could squash you. (laughs) Squash is great. I started with racquetball, and I would like to be good at racquetball, and I would like to play more racquetball, but... My sparring partner, Zach, when we played racquetball, I just hit him too many times in the head with that ball. And we didn't have goggles. We didn't really aspire to wear goggles. So he said, let's do squash and see what that's all about, because that ball doesn't bounce that much and it seems less dangerous. And now we love it. I imagine that racquetball is like racquetball is to squash as checkers is to chess. That's my interpretation. That's my understanding of the cachet between the two. I think that's fair. Interesting comparison, but I think it's fair. There is more strategy, I think, to squash. It's it's funny. It's a really small room. I don't know. The thing is, we've never received any formal squash training. I don't know if I understand the scoring or the, the strategy correctly. I hope I understand, understand the scoring correctly. But I play much more of a mind game than Zach does. Zach is almost pure physicality, and he out-athleticisms me. Is that... Man. That's good yeah, enough. Yeah, works good me enough. athletically, and then I try to win on the mind games, and I tend to do so. Right next to my house here in Cincinnati is the Cincinnati Squash Academy, which teaches underprivileged youth how to play squash in the hopes that they'll get scholarships to Ivy League-esque schools. Interesting. I wonder how many um, squash scholarships there are in a given year. I don't know, but I've been thinking about reaching out to them and learning how to play squash by being a mentor. I think it's worth it. It's a lot of fun. It's And if you get people that are good at just, you know, the basic volleys, you get a good workout in. It's a good amount of running and pivoting, and yeah, I recommend it. All right. Upside squash tournament coming to a city near you. Most of it will just be Eric versus Jay. That'll be it. On the upside tour. Well, Jay, I think we could take a tour up north of Cincinnati, up north of Columbus, and head into Michigan for this episode. That's right. We're going back to Ann Arbor a city and state we haven't really been into since the very beginnings of this podcast with Lawn Guru. Today, we're speaking with Michael Peterson and Molly McFarland, the co-founders of Ad Adapted. Ad Adapted is a digital engagement and insights platform for CPG brands and agencies. The Ad Adapted platform offers CPG brands the ability to directly target their primary consumers in the apps that they use to plan and shop. I was never very good at tennis, though. That's So now I'm kind of worried because I thought, hey, you know, if I get a couple games of squash in, maybe I can beat Jay. Maybe I can squash Jay in squash. But now I'm thinking back on it. Man, I was really bad at tennis. Do you think that's a skill that translates? Tennis does not feel at all like squash does. That works out for me. Is this more like pickleball? I was pretty good at pickleball. Never played pickleball. Okay. Well, speaking of pickles, Eric, do you use any apps to facilitate your grocery shopping? Well, we shop at Whole Foods and the, the Amazon app has a scan code. For Whole Foods. I think that is about as digitally enhanced as my shopping experience has gotten. I don't do a lot of grocery shopping. I'm diving in deeper now that I've been dating friend of the podcast, Mallory, and she does a fair amount of grocery shopping. We definitely use pencil and paper or just notes apps in our phone for the list. So I'm I'm a little bit, I have a little bit of a blind spot for what types of grocery apps exist, but it seems like that's a huge part of the ad adapted platform. So I'll have to learn a little bit about that and what scope market penetration that they have. 
But I have a lot of questions because I have not spent a lot of time in the world of CPG. I am not the grocery shopper of the household. So I think this is going to be a fairly educational interview for me. I think same thing on my side. My girlfriend and friend of the podcast, Colleen, works in CPG, but that's all the exposure I have to that world. All right. The no sense in us talking about something we don't know anything about. Let's just dive right into the interview with Michael. If you guys have any thoughts as we go through this interview, you can tweet at us at Upside FM or email us hello at Upside.FM. Hey guys, wanted to give you a quick note and ask for a quick favor. Eric and I have once again entered the South by Southwest panel picker competition to have a panel or maybe two panels at this year's South by Southwest festival. Last year, you guys came out in droves and voted for our panel and gave us the opportunity to go and speak with people at South by Southwest about geography versus investing. Does location matter? And this year we have two panels up for vote that we would appreciate your help in supporting. Eric, you want to talk a little bit about your event? Yeah, so mine is quite the tongue twister, Jay. So if I get through this in one take, it's going to be impressive. It's called Capitalist Capitalist Running a Cashless Fund. I nailed it. It's about what Jay and I are doing here on the podcast, which is essentially running a venture capital fund without making investments of money, but instead making investments of time and giving people media attention. I think this idea can apply to a lot of other spaces, and we're going to tell our story and also talk about other ways that you can think like an investor, act like an investor without making specific investments. What do you got on the docket, Jay? My panel is called Connecting Tech Communities Outside Silicon Valley. It's not nearly as fun to say as yours, but this is a panel exploring the ideas of how to connect community builders and different ecosystems across the country to one another. It's sort of this platform role for community that we've talked about more than once here on the podcast. And so if you guys wouldn't mind tossing us a vote, you just have to go to upside.fm slash vote. I'll say that again, go to upside.fm slash vote. Please give us a vote on both submissions and hopefully one of them comes through and we'll see you again this year at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Mike and Molly, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Happy to be here. Mike and Molly, wasn't that a TV show? Uh, yeah. It was. <laughs> For a while, when we first started Ad Adapted, we couldn't introduce ourselves to yeah. anybody because that show was on, and the day it got canceled was one of the best days of our lives. It was <laughs> Great. Well, I'm, I'm really happy I brought back that memory. <laughs> Good start to the interview. So on Upside, we like to start usually with the background of the guests, sometimes with related TV shows, but... Can we start with Molly? And can you tell us the history of Molly? The history of Molly. So I grew up in Maine. That's important because I, I love the great state of Maine. I went to school in New Orleans. I went to Tulane. When I was bartending there through college, that's where I met my husband, Seth. He's a car guy, car writer, auto journalist. And so he brought me back up to Michigan after we met in New Orleans. And I ended up marrying him up here. Got into sales and marketing, working for an architecture studio in Ann Arbor in Michigan. And in 2008, the whole architecture world collapsed, just like the construction world collapsed. Everything was collapsing uh, with the economy. And that's where I met a startup founder named Dick Beaton. And at that time, seeing that the traditional sort of companies that I thought I was going to be a part of were were no safer than any startup was, he convinced me that I should really try try a startup and, and, and came over to Amplifinity, which he had founded a couple of years before. And so I ended up doing, I was the marketing director there and that's where I met Mike. So Mike was already at Amplifinity and, and helping them build the platform. And then from Mike's side, can we get the history of Mike? Yeah, I'm, uh, I won't go as far back in time as Molly, but my background is engineering. So I Graduated college, hung out in the Ann Arbor area immediately afterwards. My parents owned a small business about an hour away from here. So stay in the area to help them out. And my first job out of college was kind of a small business. I wouldn't call it a startup, but it was a kind of in this niche business where we p- provided tax software to Fortune 500 companies, but we were able to really address customers with a pretty small team. So really liked that experience. After that, I jumped to some big companies, some other small companies, eventually landing at another startup and kind of realized I really hated the big company path. So from then on, I really worked with small companies and other startups, eventually leading me to Amplifinity that Molly mentioned in 2008. And I was basically the first architect of that platform. 
I built out the majority of our kind of V1 software. And that was a platform that did word of mouth marketing, where we did both online and offline, like referral tracking. I'll give you an example. Our largest client was DirecTV. So you might have seen commercials. You know, if, if you're a DirecTV customer, refer a friend, you get $150. Your friend would get 90 days or something of free service. We pretty much managed that entire process. So we had back end integrations into their CRM and payment systems. And so it was a kind of more of an enterprise referral in the software. So I ended up, uh, as the company grew, into a little bit more of a sales engineering type role since we were integrating with client systems, was working with clients in both like the pre-sale and onboarding process. And that's where Molly and I started to work together pretty closely when we were when we work on proposals. We developed you know, a good working relationship there. And that does kind of translate into how Ad Adapted founded or was started, but I'll, I'll pause there. Was Amplifinity doing well? Uh, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. The company was, I guess, it kind of at the time that we left, we had some really great customers. It was like five, uh, five enterprise customers that were probably the vast majority of our business. But there was kind of different directions that we were like looking to head, like just only enterprise versus you know, mid-tier, smaller clients. And I think that the smaller clients were a little bit more difficult to prove an ROI with. And, you know, with that, you know, I think the management had a couple of different decisions to make on, you know, where to, to take resources. But, you know, ultimately, we did have some great clients, it just probably wasn't as many as we, we needed. They were onboarding a huge client right as we left. But like Mike said, it was kind of a good time to go just because the the management and the leadership at Amplifinity was being shaken up a little bit. So it kind of felt like they needed to go back to their core and, and, and sort of level things out. And when there's transition like that, it's kind of a good time to duck out if you're going to you're gonna go. Molly, you mentioned that you, re- you realized big companies weren't necessarily safer than startups. Yeah. Do you still believe that to be true? And do people think you're crazy for thinking that? Uh, I don't think anymore. I think back then the idea of leaving a company that had maybe a hundred people or more, you know, hundred, 200 or, or, or a big corporation and it had been around for 20 years, that felt like safe. That, that felt like the type, the kind of company that you would tell your parents, I'm working for this company. I see a future here. That's what I want to do. In 2008, all of those companies, so many companies in Michigan, but really everywhere just went out of business or laid off a ton of people. You watch people that had worked somewhere for 45 years get laid off. And so you got the sense that that the safety that you thought was innate in this kind of business just wasn't there. And startups at the time, if I had told my parents before that had happened that I was just going to the startup that only had 12 months of runway and had a couple of customers, but they weren't really sure what they were doing next and they wanted to bring me in and, and I had to sort of come up with a sales and marketing strategy too. That that sounded crazy, but then the shift made that seem a lot more reasonable. Now I feel like everybody wants to join a startup. I mean, now Facebook and Google and all these other things are, have become just normal names in everybody's household. So everybody's parents understand the idea of working at a startup. It's not It's not as crazy as it was eight years ago. When was the first time the two of you worked together on something? Oh, was it Miller? Was it the Miller course? Remember we had to come up with a, remember the, so we had one of, one of oh, the yeah. marketing guys at Amplifinity got us an opportunity with an agency out of Florida. And it was basically come up with a way to do referral programs or use the referral software for some sort of cool uh, initiative that would be for Miller cores and it would be on mobile which was something that we were hearing a lot. Like everybody, everybody knew mobile was coming and nobody knew how to address it back then. And I remember Mike and I sort of going back and forth, him from a, a technology side and me from a, how do we explain this and, and put it into material side for this, yeah, for this new thing we were working on. I don't think it went anywhere. No, I don't, no. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> and how, what time frame was that? Like when was the first time you two wor- worked together and how long did you work together before you made the this, made this shift to Ad Adapted? Probably, that was probably around 2010, mm-hmm. 2000, yeah, probably around 2010. And we left and we started at Adapted in 2012. So talk to me about how we got there. And was it something where you guys were both itching to start something on your own and you kind of came across something and said, why don't we work together? Or did the problem become so obvious that one of you broke off? You know, just tell us the origin story. So backing up a little bit in, in timeline, the investment group behind Amplifinity 
had this concept where they wanted to spin up, well, ex- yeah, I guess I wanted to explore spinning up essentially an incubator of marketing and ad tech companies. Amplifinity was very much a marketing tech company. Uh, the CMO at the time uh, had a lot of experience in advertising and PR and just kind of driving this. And they started asking some employees just to, to kind of pitch ideas. And at the time, mobile, like smartphones were out, the iPhone was was definitely out, but I think the majority of time spent was mobile games, right? It wasn't as it wasn't as vast, you know, as games and Facebook, you know, social media. I think that was kind of it. It wasn't, you know, the tools uh, that we use it for now. So pitched them the idea uh, at the time, what was ad adapted. Kind of the core concept would be more of just native advertising in mobile apps. I think like a product placement model that would pull through not just kind of form function of advertisement, but actual utility. And so pitched them this idea probably back at the end of 2011 roughly, and started working with the man, one of the managing directors of the, the investment group behind Amplifinity. So we're calling potential clients, potential investors, you know, working on some initial pitch decks, just trying to you know, see if this had legs. And so they liked the idea a lot. So they were very supportive. So we were working on it kind of on the side, nights and weekends, all above board, but you know, just more or less just trying to vet everything out. And that led to probably end of 2011 into 2012, where uh, the group decided to purchase a company. It was a med tech company, so vastly different from like their wheelhouse and what they knew. And with that, they decided to scrap the incubator idea and basically said, you know, we've put this work into it. If you want to take it and run with it, go for it. And that's where I reached out to Molly for some help. So I had been part of sales pitches. I have never put together a deck on my own. I've never actually constructed a real pitch. And when they said this, they introduced me to some VCs. So I had some connections where we wanted to go start out, try to raise some money, get connected with people in the industry. But I didn't know how to put a deck together, really. You know, not I could, but not in like a good, good format or anything like that. So that's why I went to Molly to ask her for help. And that kind of just helped me build a deck, spent some hours with me on Saturday or Sunday, just, you know, doing some assembly, listen to a pitch. And I'll let Molly give her side uh, or give her her perspective. Yeah, no, I totally thought at the time that I was just sort of helping out a friend do some sort of marketing side project. If I had no idea that I was joining a new company or starting a new company, but it was fun. It was really like, we had some decent connections, even though we were pretty young through the investment company or the investment firm that was invested in Amplifinity. And then some of the people that we knew that we were close with at the company, we were able to get meetings with the agency for Ford. I think we were talking to the agency for McDonald's. I don't know if that was pre us leaving or not. <laughs> we were talking to some investors. We were way over our heads and we were putting together these decks with just like the craziest mocks you've ever seen. But we knew we were, I guess, cocky enough and naive enough that we sort of knew what an investment pitch should look like. So we just put it together and went out there. And it still surprises me to this day. We were getting pretty good feedback. So we did that probably 10 or 20 times, taking these calls after hours or taking these calls on Saturdays. And we just kept getting people saying, you guys are close. You guys are close to something. Yes, this actually has legs. And you do that enough and you say, oh, we can't abandon this. We, we have to put full time into it. But it's never that first pitch. You're like, let's just try it. Let's just see. It's not going to go anywhere. And then you're 20 in, you're like, oh my God, I'm leaving my, I'm leaving my company and my 401k and we're starting something new. So what was the close? What did they see that seemed to have legs in the concept at that point? So you're always looking for the no when you start those pitches. So so we were out there saying, you guys see what's going on with mobile. You see the hole in the marketing strategy for most large companies in, in America. You see that there's this new type of opportunity that's presenting themselves that that's not being addressed. And you sort of run through those things first, just the market opportunity. And when you have investors and clients saying, yes, 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 I agree with that. Basically, what they're saying is, you're not missing anything. You're right. Your assumptions are right. And then we come in and say, all right, well, we think that the way to address it is X, Y, and Z. We, we have this technology. This is what it looks like. This is how it would work. And you'd have people be like, yes, yes, yes. That, that, sounds, that sounds good. And so we just kept, we kept pitching in like that. And then nobody was just handing over cash at that moment, but we'd have investors say, you know what? This space is really exciting. 
the answer that you guys are putting forth is really exciting. If you could just show us a little bit of traction or just show us a, a, a few things, we would be interested in investing. And when they would tell us that and would see that those things were attainable, like, okay, just get, get some potential clients to either give you a little bit of money or get the right feedback and then come back to us. We were like, all right, we can do that. And that, that's how it played out. And then we ended up getting Biore as an early client. They only gave us $5,000, but it was a big name brand skincare company. And they, they signed up with us before we really had anything. And that was sort of some of the traction that we needed. Was that what tipped you over to starting both of you going full time on this? Or what pushed you guys to go all in on Ad Adapted? We probably did it too early. We, <laughs> we, did, no, we did it way earlier than that. But it, it got to a point where we were getting enough meetings with both. So we, we kind of have a marketplace model. So we'd sell the two groups, publishers and then advertisers. So between the publishers, advertisers, and then looking for investment, you know, we were ducking out at different hours during the middle of the day, whether to take a call or to actually go somewhere for a meeting. And so that I think one, Amplifinity wasn't super thrilled about that. And also too, we knew that if we needed, if, if we were going to make this leap, we had to just go all in. You, you can't start something just part-time. You can only go so far with that. So we decided that there was just you know great opportunity here and we wanted to capture it. So we, we left to really just go heads down. To clarify, you guys went all in in 2012, or was there kind of like a little bit of lead time from starting the company to, all right, time to leave this safety nest and dive in? Yeah, there was a little bit of lead time. Ultimately, I think we left Amplifinity mid-year in 2012, but had you know had started having meetings with people and, and were vetting things out late 2011 and, and into early 2012. Do we have an LLC in February 2012. I think that's yeah, I th- yeah. I think we technically founded the company February, and then we're we're on our own June, July. What did that feel like going from I'm guessing financially secure jobs or semi secure jobs to going out and not having investors, having a five thousand dollar check at the time? How did you manage that emotionally and financially? It was super stressful. <laughs> we fought a lot. <laughs> It's just super stressful. You're watching your bank account dwindle. My husband and I would constantly talk about what we, or actually Mike, I think you adopted this line too. We'd call it our austerity plan. Cause like you couldn't, we'd go out to dinner with people. We couldn't spend any money. You can't go out. I mean, even groceries, we were buying things differently. Cause we just, you'd watch your bank account just slowly drain. And you didn't know when it was going to come back on. Mike was single. I was married at the time. I'm sorry. Still married. <laughs> Continue to be married. Um, but at that time too. And yeah, you just, Seth was super patient, but he would ask me like, how long do you think this is going to last? You know, all of our savings are, are almost gone. I, there's no way to sugarcoat that. I mean, it's, we didn't know what was going to happen. And there were definitely times where I at least had a lot of doubt that, that it was going to work out, but we, you just keep pushing. Did you string that out until you guys got accepted to the brandery or was there some investment oh. before that? Yeah, there was investment. For that. Yeah, one of the benefits of Ann Arbor, there is a local economic development, well, here in Michigan and in general, but Ann Arbor has a group called Spark, uh, which is a, a really great setup for you know startups, emerging companies to get some help from the state. And ultimately, they, they provided us with quite a bit. They helped build out like our first marketing website. They paid for some local talent to build that. Uh, and they also had some really, really nice loan programs specifically oriented for startups. Some were for the state of Michigan. And there was there's another one that uh, was set for Ann Arbor. So they weren't, it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was really enough money for us to make sure that we could you know, pay our bills while also using that money to grow various aspects. Um, so we invested in some R&D in, in sales and marketing coming from like websites and, and other sales oriented, I guess, activities. Yeah. So that was like a little bit of a backstop that we had that did help. Uh, we knew that it wasn't going to last forever. So that that money, I think we, we got a loan in probably late 2012 and then ended up raising a seed round in 2013. And here we're sitting middle of 2019. So a lot has happened and gone by. Yeah. How would you guys, let's, let's start by saying, what is Ad Adapted today? So Ad Adapted is a, it's a mobile marketing platform. What we do, we specialize with working with CPG brands. So CPG consumer packaged goods, just to give you guys a little bit of a sense of the landscape right now, big companies like General Mills or Kellogg's or P&G or Unilever, all of these companies that are selling most of their products in brick and mortar stores, 
don't have an easy way to track whether the money that they're putting into online advertising is actually getting people to buy their product. There just is a fundamental disconnect between being able to advertise to somebody on a, on a mobile screen or a computer screen, and then that person walking in and putting something into their cart and, and, and spending. So one of the things that mobile phones and the adoption of, of mobile has, has opened up, or an opportunity that has opened up, is people are now incorporating those devices into that shopper journey. So all of a sudden, the things that they used to do on pen and paper, you know, like write a list, writing down what they're going to buy, they're now using their mo mobile phones for, which is creating a digital footprint or, or digital clues. Okay, this person intends to buy these products. So we were already advertising in, in mobile apps. We had a way to advertise in mobile apps that was more compelling or, or more integrated than what other people were doing at the time. And so when we saw this hole, we said... Why don't we insert our ads into these, these mobile areas where people are, are providing these clues and we'll have something for CPGs that nobody else has. So today what we're doing is we're finding the apps that people are using on this shopper journey, mostly list apps. So the apps that people download to write down what they're going to buy. And we harvest data from those apps as well as advertise in those apps and then go out and get clients like the Kellogg's or General Mills or PNGs of the world. We have this really cool ad unit that we call Add It that allows us to advertise to somebody, whether they have their list app open or not, wherever we can find that person on mobile. And we can put a product in front of them and allow them to instantly add it to their shopping list which is convenient for the shopper, but also really cool for the advertiser because they can say, wow, I showed somebody an ad and it actually got them to say that they wanted to buy. And that's our bread and butter. That's, that's what we're doing really well with right now. So is there a turning point or like a moment where that whole design of the interaction, how this works for both sides of the marketplace kind of clicked for you guys between where we left off in that 2013 story and today? Yeah, we've definitely grown over time and we've we've really looked to our clients to sort of like navigate the direction. I mean, the ultimate or sorry, ultimately what we built initially was a very broad, like flexible platform. It had like a ton of bells and whistles. There's a lot of things that a customer could do with the platform, probably too many, right? Mm -hmm. It could be overwhelming, right? We could say we can do X, Y, and Z. And really customers oftentimes just wanted X solved. For example, so as we worked with a lot of our customers, you know, as Molly mentioned, we focused primarily on CPG, but that wasn't our that wasn't necessarily where we started out at. Biore was our first client, but we worked with the Detroit Lions and Ford, Fathead, Discover Card, brands that definitely were very far from CPG. And oddly enough, our first very large customer, when it was still just the two of us in the company, was uh, Bank of America through one of their agencies based in Chicago who liked some of the recipe apps that we had started to work with. And initially they had a credit card that gave cash back to you as you, if you use that card for grocery shopping. So they wanted to promote that message. They wanted to have essentially bring recipe content to these various apps sponsored by Bank of America. And that kind of led us down this direction of grocery list apps, recipe, meal planning, uh, you know, essentially apps that, people were using in, in lieu of, you know, the back of an envelope. So we started building out, you know, more partnerships uh, with publishers of that nature. Another client asked us if we could help drive products to these grocery lists or, you know, save products to people's phones. So when they're walking through the store, they can use their phone for recall. And that led to a product that we now call Add It, which is an ad that shows a product. If consumers interested, they click a button, they put it on their grocery list. So this kind of like one click shopping experience directly from an advertisement. Basically in 2016, we decided to just really go all in on that product probably about mid year. At that point, we just transitioned really solely to the CPG clients, kind of stopped working with a number of the other clients that weren't really related, as well as stopped really development on products that weren't going to facilitate this new model. And that's where things really taken off. Like that focus really changed the trajectory of the company entirely. And like since then, we've pretty much doubled year over year revenue bookings, probably team as well. So kind of that inflection point was really where everything changed for Ad Adapted. When you say these list apps, like, is that Evernote? Is that the Notepad app on my phone? Is that Kroger when they have their own app with lists? Like where, what are list apps? 
I'm not a grocery shopper, obviously. No, no, no. You're, you're in the right ballpark. So there are apps like, honestly, if you just Google grocery list apps or you're on your phone and you're looking at the app store and you just type in grocery list, there's basically a variety of apps that, that help people grocery shop in different ways. The ones that we do really well with are the ones that are created by independent developers. So sometimes we used to say it's like, could be two guys in a garage, maybe it's an independent company, but they basically created a app that allows people to more efficiently shop. Some of those examples would be something like AnyList or Out of Milk or Buy Me a Pie or Listonic, Fujicate. People download them for different reasons, whether they want nutritional information or they want an easy way to save recipes, or maybe they just want something that's super easy to jot down like Notepad, but still categorizes their list in a way that's more friendly for the grocery shopping experience. Yes, different retailers have their own apps too. We've talked to some of those retailers, they present different challenges. Also, we've started to work with more productivity apps that that mirror Evernote more closely because those would also count. But it's really anything that allows people to jot things down to a grocery shop. And we're talking this Addit product goes purely into native apps. This isn't anything that's web or browser based. Correct. Most of that is the reason that we're doing it is when somebody has this app downloaded, like a grocery a grocery list app. We can obviously track that person inside of the app or or serve that person ads inside of the app. But what we figured out is that we could also find that person that we know has this app downloaded on their phone and we could serve them advertisements outside of that app, still show them a product. And if they like that product, they click on it and it allows that product to be put right on that person's in-app grocery list. Does that make sense? If I can say that in another way to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, when they download an app, you can cookies the wrong word, but you can identify them and you can still advertise to them through outside of the app. Yep. And when they click that ad, it opens up the app that they can then add it to their list. Or it automatically puts it onto their... Kind of like a retargeting. Yes. <laughs> but it makes it convenient. So imagine like, you know, if you really do see a product that you like, it's a new type of yogurt, it fits into your lifestyle really well. You're not going to remember it. You're not at the grocery store right there, but you're also one of these people that has a grocery list app downloaded. You can see it and in one click, basically add it to your shopping list by, by interacting with that ad unit that we served you. So all that said, the reason that we advertise in app pretty much exclusively is because we can find those people in app. You, we can't make that connection outside. We can't make the connection onto mobile web and still allow for that functionality to happen or, or still find those people mm-hmm. in order to make that functionality mm-hmm. happen. So how many publisher apps do you work with at this point? Over 20 right now. I think we're getting closer to like 25 or so. And some of them have multiple apps. So what are the people, Eric and I already self-pronounced non-grocery shopper type people, what is the typical owner of this app look like? What, what, who are these customers? It's actually kind of across the board. So we've gotten some demographic data from some of our app partners in the past. And what we've seen is depending on the different app, you can see a pretty even split between men and women. Some apps have some apps cater more to the, let's say, millennial mom. So somebody that's between like even like 25 and 35 looking for ways to keep track of their daily lives by using their their mobile device. But we're also seeing that, you know, Young men, like let's say guys in their 20s, uh, also will download some of these different apps. And it's probably just to, to make things more convenient for themselves. It's not always just grocery too. Maybe sometimes it's just jotting down the things that somebody has to do in a day or other things that they have to buy. So anybody that would do that. But it's not really, it's not that niche in terms of specific demographics. How many people in the United States, like, or however you have this kind of global data, how big is this population of people using these type of apps or these specific type of apps. And then also the ones you said you might go after, which is the retailer apps and the productivity apps. It's actually super hard to find a number to to lock into exactly what that is. What we've seen in the past is, you know, over a third of the nation, like let's say over a hundred million people are somehow using their device to recall the products that they want to buy. Now that's, that, comes in a variety of ways. So a lot of that would be just jotting down something into notepad. A lot of that would be jotting something down in a text to send your spouse. But what we're seeing over time by the by having the apps that we're integrated in and just watching them over the last five years, we're seeing that more and more people want a 
a dedicated technology that helps them do that in an easier way. So for instance, when you have a grocery list app, when you add a product, let's say I add yogurt, milk, and eggs, and I buy those things every single week, a grocery list app will keep track of those things for me. So I don't have to retype them in every time. It'll also categorize a lot of our apps categorized by cat, you know, department. So you can see all your vegetables in one place. So for anybody that's using their phone, what we're seeing is people are starting to make that leap from notepad or text into something that, that makes it even more efficient and convenient. So if you see like 100 million people that are using their phones in some way right now, probably about a third of those or a quarter of those are using something that's uh, built for that, that sort of task. And we're hoping to see that grow more and more over time. How do you decide who sees what ad? Yeah, so we collect, so you touched on, are we doing cookies? So mobile phones have essentially a more persistent cookie that exists. It's called um, an advertiser ID. So they exist on Android and iOS. There's no personal identification tied to that. It's just a random ID that a user can reset. They can clear it out on their own. So you know, there's no phone numbers, no emails. We basically get data from the app partners that we have through a technology, through an SDK integration, that we're able to tie behaviors and related products on a list to an individual. And from there, we can create profiles for specific sets of, of users that we see. And then what we do is basically programmatic advertising. So a lot of it is very similar to just remarketing, retargeting, where we have a set of users who we have a set of behaviors tied to, where we can then basically programmatically target individual user or set of users. We could say these are our yogurt lovers or these are our you know, pet owners where we can just basically find consumers anytime that they're using mobile apps in general. That could be the list itself when they're planning their grocery trip or when they're actually in the store pulling the phone up at the aisle. Could be when they're in another app checking the weather. We can target them in, in a number of different ways. So we basically build profiles that we then target consumers across the board. Jay really likes wasabi peas. Isn't that weird? It's been a while. I love this. I love wasabi yeah. peas. Too. Really? Oh my God. I think it's the weirdest thing in the world. All right. I'm the odd one here. Yeah. Quick question on serving the ads. Do you have any ability to connect customer loyalty cards? Yes. Yes, we do. So when we work with a retailer, so this would be the non kind of agnostic lists. If the retailer has loyalty, we can integrate into their mobile apps where the loyalty typically exists. Uh, you know, we see a lot of apps now that are offering, say, broadly like e-com. So that could be in-store or sorry, like curbside pickup or delivery. A lot of times these retailers then will have a loyalty program tied to that where we can essentially take that loyalty card and, and tie it to the users of our apps. And we can use that as an item for targeting. We've also experimented with using that as just a way for additional attribution for advertising. You mentioned earlier on in the interview that these CPG companies have no way of attributing if their ad spend is going towards people buying something in store. So when, when CPG companies are going with ad adapted, is it because it gives them a clear line of sight of, I put money into this, I see that money happen from this, or is it expanding the pie? Like, can you guys prove that you're actually creating more purchases than they were getting before? Yeah. I mean, and don't get me wrong. Like these guys... When you look at advertisers like like P&G, they're, they're some of the largest advertisers in the world, right? And they're, and they're really good at what they do and they understand it really well. What they can't necessarily do is tie like a single ad unit to an actual, like some sort of performance metric. So what, they, what they're usually doing is looking in broad strokes. What if we advertise to a whole region or, or to a, a to con, to a exposed group, right? If you have a control exposed and then what happens and what differences do we see? But it's really hard to say, I showed advertisement A to individual Y, and that made an impact on whether that, that person was going to buy. And that's just the nature of, of having online versus offline. Now, Ad Adapt is coming to the table and saying, wait, no, I can, right? I can tell you right now we have this panel of millions of grocery shoppers, and I can take two different versions of your ad, and I can show these shoppers, and I can tell you which one convinced people to actually say, you know what? I actually intend to buy that, that product. What we talk about a lot internally is this idea of, of being able to measure purchase intent. So part of the shopper journey is 
before you buy, you're making a decision to buy a product. So you're, you, you might be aware of the product, then there's this idea that you're actually going to, you would tend to buy it, and then you go and buy it. And Ad Adapted is, is really good at measuring that, that middle piece, that purchase intent, and there really isn't a lot of other options for a CPG to do that. In terms of what piece of the pie we're getting, that's actually really interesting for us right now. And it depends on what type of advertiser you are. So if you're a, a big media company and you're just buying, you just want to get as many impressions as you possibly can, and you're an agency for one of these CPGs, you're probably looking at us for getting awareness, getting in front of our shoppers, but also having more insights than they can get from, from their other vendors. When you're shopper marketing, and you've been doing a lot of offline stuff and you want to get more of the online budget, we might be a new piece. We might be a new tool in their in their tool shed that they haven't been able to use before. And they're using that to go to their clients and say, hey, this is a shopper. This has to do with being in a grocery store. It, it's right in our lane, even though it's digital. Give us more money so we can give it to Ad Adapted and, and get you in there. But it's a great question. And it's, it's kind of a messy landscape right now. Why would a publisher want this in their app? It's hard to be an app publisher, uh, which is something that we've realized over time. So we've seen some really great apps struggle to do well. What's interesting for these grocery list app publishers is you really want to keep your user base. You want to keep them, you want to keep them happy, and you want them to, to keep coming back, right? And that's that's not easy in, it, in its own right. And then, of course, you want to monetize those users. you got to find a way to, to get revenue from them. And right now, your choices are usually just doing like banner ads and, and pop-ups. And banner ads pay next to nothing. They're usually advertising things that are completely irrelevant to your, to your, to your users. Pop-ups are terrible, like any sort of interstitial that's, that's stopping them from being able to use their app sucks. And you're not getting paid very much. All of a sudden, Ad Adapted comes along and says, hey, guess what? We will work with you to design an ad unit that really fits your experience inside of your app. We'll serve your users really relevant ads that actually match what they want to do and make it convenient to use your, your app more, right, to add more products to, to, your, to their list. We'll bring them back into the app when they're not, when they're not using your app by showing them advertisements that, that pull them back in. And we'll pay you a higher CPM um, than you can get from any other banner ads. And to be honest, it's usually a pretty compelling story. It's, it's rare that we have publishers reject us once they really like take the call and, and learn about what we're doing. And we've had almost nobody leave us unless the app had you know, left or maybe shut down for, for different reasons. But all of our publishers have stayed with us because they're so happy with what we're giving them. On the advertiser side, on your website, it says that Ad Adapted's platform places your product in front of your consumer at the exact right moment and guarantees your product will be added to their shopping list. How do you guarantee that it'll be on the shopping list? So what we're, what we're saying there is we can track whether somebody actually puts it on their list and we can also make sure that it's not an accidental click. So because we're so far integrated into the app that we can see somebody saw this ad, they clicked, they added to their list. They didn't just cross it off immediately. It was something that was in intended to be there. We guarantee that you're only paying for the people that actually added it to their list. That it wasn't just, you know, fat fingering the, the product on there. One of the other changes we made in 2016 is we introduced a performance pricing model, which is not which is pretty not standard for CPGs. Uh, typically, a CPG is buying eyeballs one way or the other. So CPM, cost per impression. You know, if you think you're buying TV, you're trying to buy household audiences, for example. We started offering, and we can still offer a CPM as well, but we offer the ability for CPGs to only pay us when a product is successfully added to a grocery list. And so what that means for the CPG is they're going to be buying impressions no matter what whether it's digital or TV, radio, print, like they are, that's essentially what they're buying. We can just take this add to list technology and apply it to the ads that they were going to be buying. So the impressions that they're used to buying anyways are free and we'll just charge them when someone successfully you know, adds something to their list. So when we're able to find the right consumer, that's when they pay, not, not for just regular brand advertising, that's basically free when you work with Ad Adapted. What margin do you guys keep and what margin goes to the publishers? So unlike other models, we don't have a 50-50 split. We pay our publishers a fixed rate whenever we're buying ads from them. And we buy ads then from various other ad exchanges where that could be on an auction basis. 
since we're charging on performance, it's really up to Ad Adapted to just be really laser focused with targeting, build the right data sets, find the right consumers. So we've been able to really ramp up our margin over time. Uh, that's something that's not really traditional in the advertising industry. Last year, our margin was slightly under 75%. And, and a lot of that is just how we've how we've been able to build our attack and, and their targeting capabilities. As a CPG advertiser, I love the idea of performance-based ads. And I'm guessing they don't have a lot of options, to your point, for performance-based ads in this world they're living in. Why did you guys decide that you were going to do that versus just continuing to do the impression game? Margin was one. <laughs> I mean, business factors for sure. Because ultimately, it it does get tough. When you're selling impressions and, and the way the industry has changed, especially with digital, it is a little bit more challenging to kind of really grow, I say like grow relationships because brands are worried now about where is my ad spend going? You know, what, it, what is actually guaranteed to me? You know, if you take a look at like desktop advertising, for example, advertisers are buying ads that are, you know, 10 scrolls down the page, they're getting charged for that, you know, so you know, what value is that to them? And that's definitely something unique to digital. You know, some of those don't necessarily apply to TV, for example. And so when we were looking at just things as a whole, one, performance base didn't really exist outside of like coupons and rebates and you know, essentially you know, bribing your consumers to try a product. So there wasn't a whole lot of performance basis there. And then two, you know, we, we knew that they were going to be buying ads no matter what. So if we could offer a different type of structure for them so that there was some guaranteed performance that wasn't just a standard click. You know, it wasn't just someone saw an ad. It was something that was multiple steps that was really a, a good driver on just to consumer behavior. That kind of combination of things like all led into this big push to, to really push our clients into performance-based pricing. Is it possible for you to lose money since you're performance-based? Like if you underwrite something wrong? Yeah, it, it could be, yes. Yeah. We saw that we were in a position to offer it because we just were, were tracking our performance for so long too, right? You just really looked at the numbers and you model it out. And what we figured out is we can take the risk because we feel like we have enough controls in place to, to make sure that you know that's not gonna happen often. We'll take that risk on for our clients. And when it works out, we'll be rewarded for it, right? When we, when we do our job really well, we're rewarded for it and that, then everybody's happy. What's the like holy grail here? The holy grail uh, for like what we're, like the actual product that we're, we're putting out there? For ad adapted, I mean, I think when we talk to our our customers, the holy grail is being able to say, can we can we know a consumer so well that we can put a product in front of them that is like a one to one match for that consumer? Like like Mike said, if we can look at their list data and know this is a vegetarian that has kids and shops at Kroger and makes her lists on Wednesdays and goes shopping on Saturdays, right? Can we advertise with that granularity, get an ad in front of somebody, get really high performance because we know that this person is going to like this product, get that product on their list, and then even eventually track that they went to that Kroger and they, they cross it off. Now that's like, I mean, that's holy grail. That's not going to happen tomorrow. What we're working through though is Look at the proprietary data that only we get, which is everything that's going on the list. How do we incorporate some other data that maybe other players have or sort of the eco, you know, exists in the ecosystem, whether it's location data, whether it's other, you know, sort of third party attribution for sales. And how do we tie this all together so we can provide that that level of, of understanding of, of consumer behavior? How much do you guys have to think about like a post mobile world? Like what does ad adapted look like in five years? Oh. We talked a little bit about uh, <laughs> AR, right? No, that, that's a good question. You know, I, I don't know if it, I would think that the it's going to be post mobile, you know, in five years from now. But what we, I think, some of the changes that we see uh, that's really interesting is the ecom component to to grocery shopping now, and and seeing how that growth definitely plays out over the next few years. I think when Amazon bought Whole Foods, that just kicked off a number of things just in the industry as a whole. And, you know, for good and bad, I mean, definitely there's some benefits to ad adapted for sure that have come about. But if you're, you know, when you're looking at as a CPG or a retailer, that just introduced a whole set of problems for you. Like Amazon is known to come in and, and, you know, I think the battery example is great. Duracell advertised on Amazon like crazy. Amazon figured out who those consumers were, made their own batteries and, you know, just took over that, you know, just took over the battery industry. Yeah. 
And so other CPGs saw that model, so they're scared. Retailers see how Amazon can deliver. Amazon, you know, bought delivery and you know, essentially e-com to Whole Foods pretty quickly. So in your Walmart, your Kroger, they rolled out those platforms as soon as they possibly could. And, and, and now that they're now they're essentially in a fight with Amazon to you know, capture customers and then the e-com platforms. And so that's just something that we're, we've been looking at pretty closely, uh, looking at the small, mid-sized retailers who now also have to have those offerings because you know. If, if Walmart can deliver to a home, your mom and pop down the road, they're scared. So now, you know, they're looking at technologies to, you know, facilitate that process for them uh, or other companies to even take that last mile delivery off their hands. And that's uh, something that, you know, we, we definitely keep an eye on over the past, I guess, say probably year or so. But that's definitely something that's going to be growing over the next three to four years. Speaking of growing, you've said that your team has now doubled year over year for the last few years in terms of team size and bookings. So what is the scale to which you guys are delivering conversions now for these CPG companies? We have a large CPG that spent half a million dollars a month with us earlier this year. And that was you know, definitely not even kind of touching everyone that we, we could have for that brand. So upside for a brand is probably at least a you know, million dollars a month nationally. That's wild. How many brands do you guys work with at this point? I don't know. That's a great question. So I think we did what, 92 contracts last year? Mm -hmm. So 92 contracts, but we have a lot of repeat brands too. So I'm guessing it's probably, you know, 50. Yeah. We don't have a SaaS model. It's everything is is typically IO based insertion order contract. On average, I'd say a lot of our clients work with us in three month stints. Uh, We do have annual contracts with a number of our really large clients, but the majority of our clients are a really promotional based, a lot of seasonality. So a brand can work with us for three months and maybe they take a pause for a month and they come back and it, you know, it really depends a lot on the seasonality. So when we look at total brands that we've worked with, it's it's definitely in the in the hundreds. On average, we typically have, I'd say probably about 30 different brands in market and that could be across two to three products per brand. What are some of the KPIs you guys look at to see how healthy your company is? I mean, revenue is a big one. It's also the number of clients that are running with us at, at any given time, making sure like in order to keep our relationship solid on the other end with the publishers, we have to make sure that there's sort of a steady stream of revenue running to them. Like I said, they really like us. Nobody's pulling us out. We get priority for any ads that we're serving over other other ads. But if we just stopped giving these guys money, that that's going to dry up. They're not doing it out of the kindness of their heart. So making sure that 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 revenue is is there so we can keep passing that on. Also things just like click through rate, frequency, how do we have to hit the same users over and over again or are we able to find the right user for our clients? Those are all are important to our to our metrics. Mm-hmm. Important metrics yeah. to track. And so we definitely look at margin as margin, mentioned yeah. and you know gross profit. We we funnel profits back into growth of the company you know, as quickly as possible. And then kind of tied to that, we look at CAC in kind of two ways new customers, and then basically acquisition costs for contracts, whether it's a repeat customer or a new customer. And that's probably one of the bigger uh, bigger metrics that we do track, ultimately trying to keep that as low as possible, like just really efficiently getting new clients on board, as well as constantly getting existing clients to rebuy from us over time. So definitely CAC in a couple different ways is is something we keep an eye on. What are the biggest drivers of CAC in your guys' business given that these are huge contracts? Direct sales is, is our primary business model. So it, it's really going to be like the cost of sales. That's going to be the number one item. How big is your team now, Mike? We are 20 people. Wow. And is that mostly like account managers? You know, the majority of it is actually sales. We have our, our structure is we have a couple of VPs in kind of regionally focused. So one in New York, one in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is Walmart country, one here in the Midwest uh, who covers Chicago for the most part and in some of the other Midwest cities. So those VPs basically are supported by, we have what now, four or five junior people, you know, setting up calls, generating leads for the VPs to, to close. And that's kind of a model we've taken, bringing on young talent, starting them off in a sales role so they can really understand the business, like what we're selling, which is very important. And then, you know, letting them expand into different roles in the company over time. So typically you join and you spend nine months to a year kind of in the sales role. And then, you know, with aptitude, you can, you can move into different departments. When you think CPG, you think New York, you think Arkansas, you think Cincinnati, you think Chicago, Minnesota, 
maybe San Francisco. Why is Ann Arbor the right place for this company? Ann Arbor is a, compared to some of the cities you listed, it's uh, very cost effective. It, it's the Midwest and it's not Chicago, right? And it's great talent. Right. And it's centrally located. Like, so mm-hmm. there's great talents coming out of University of Michigan right there and you can get it, get it efficiently. And then we can't have headquarters in all those different places. So being centrally located makes sense. Like it wouldn't make sense for us to set up shop in, in the middle of New York. Minneapolis would be the same sort of problems that you'd have. You'd have some customers there, but you'd be traveling all the time. So for us, it, this is where we're from. This is where we, we have a network and we were able to get investment as well as find engineers and, and, Mm-hmm. Made sense for us to stay here. You know, also if you think about it, Ann Arbor is the the operational like center for us engineers, operational talent, whether it's ad ops, account management, things of that nature. I mean, ultimately, as we grow, we'll have more people in market. Yeah. You know, we will find someone for Chicago. We'll find someone for Chica- uh, San Francisco as we grow. So it'll be, it'll be a combination of not an Ann Arbor talent, but you know, the kind of the core is going to be here. And, and it's a model that uh, we've seen a number of other large companies kind of take on, you know, looking for some areas where you're not paying an, an engineer $300,000, like right out of college. Awesome. Well, we mentioned the intro, but we, we haven't been in the state of Michigan for, gosh, probably a year on the show. So good to chat with you guys and learn more about Ad Adapted and what you guys are doing. If people want to learn more about Ad Adapted or the two of you after the show, where should they go? It's our website or hit us up on LinkedIn. We are, <laughs> that's probably the easiest. Yeah, at adapted.com. All right, Eric, we just spoke with Mike Peterson and Molly McFarland of Ad Adapted, diving into CPG, something that we're not super familiar with. Do you want to start with the founders? Or do you want to start with the opportunity? No, I want to start with a big fail I had in that interview. I thought that Wasabi Peas were weird, and Jay, I was outnumbered three to one. You're the only person I've met that has been so vehemently against wasabi peas. I just don't under like, did I miss something growing up? Did everyone else have wasabi peas? And I just, I never had them. I never saw them. I don't know. It's not I even growing like, up. It's, it's something, it's the last three years thing for me. Have you ever tried one? I tried them at your house and then I spilled them all over the floor, I think. Uh, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and they're fine, but like, I don't get, I don't get it, to be honest. Well, I think they're great. And if I got an advertisement for them in one of the list apps that I don't actually use, I might add it to my cart. Do you think you'll start using list apps after this interview? Probably not. I mean, it's not a problem that I feel, you know, so until I feel a problem, I'm not going to use it. But I certainly, you know, will keep a note in my Evernote. And if there were a compelling reason to move that into a dedicated app, maybe I would. I just don't feel that need. What was the name of the one that she said? Let them eat pie or something? I like that one. That seemed like a nice name. Yeah. I don't think that's the actual so, name, but that's what's in my head. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So they're in 20 to 25 publishers, like Let Them Eat Pie or whatever list apps that they're in. They've worked with something like 92 different brands in the last year. These are some compelling numbers. Some of those brands paying upwards of $500,000 to a $1 million in ad spend per month team of 20 seems to be that ad adapted has been doing pretty well since this focus in 2016 that they mentioned and if they've raised two million dollars to date since 2012 it seems like you know cash is flowing pretty well and and they might be in a control of their own destiny yeah what is it about ann arbor companies just being profitable and not needing investment and then coming on this show (laughs) just kidding shout out to lawn guru who came on way early who is absolutely knocking the cover off the ball as well. Jay, I want to start here in our deal memo with the market, which I think fits into my bucket of massive. If we look at advertising spend globally for CPGs, it's looking at somewhere around $225 billion. About half of that is in digital advertising. The other half is in traditional, so that's your movie, media, print, all of that kind of stuff, or sorry, TV, print, radio. And the digital side has been growing significantly faster than traditional. So they're in a growing market. They're in a huge market. That says to me there's some real money to be made here. Seems like it. Margins seem healthy. Healthy is, is an understatement. My, my biggest shadow or question here comes to the relationship with publishers for a couple of reasons. One of which being, I'm not entirely positive what the growth trajectory of publishers are or 
user usage of publishers. One interesting nugget we got recently was the factoid that 51% of users are downloading an average of zero apps per month. So if people are downloading fewer apps, will there be more publishers? Will there be as much usage as the publishers? And can they keep those publishers happy? Because if they have a stable of 20 to 25, if you start dwindling that down for whatever reason, that becomes less attractive to the advertisers. So that is my biggest shadow is just keeping, I mean, it's, it's basic marketplace dynamics, the same for any marketplace. You have to keep both sides healthy. And that seems like the one that is at larger risk or could lead to a collapse of the marketplace. Maybe. I, I think if they can get into the retailers and productivity apps side of things, they can diversify that risk a bit. I also think that since the dawn of grocery stores, people have been writing down grocery lists and likely the trend is not going to turn back to paper and pen anytime in the future. Although you as a 27, are you 27 now? You just turned an age. 28. 28. Wow. Getting up there, man. You as a newly 20, newly minted 28 year old millennial still uses paper and pen. However, so, my girlfriend, who is also a late 20s millennial, does all of her grocery shopping curbside pickup. Hmm. I wonder how that changes. That should have been something we asked about. They mentioned but if it's in your bit. shopping list. They, they kind of alluded to it with the Whole Foods purchase of, or the Amazon purchase of Whole Foods. But with things like grocery delivery or curbside pickup, which is on trend, that's also a little bit of a shadow. However, I don't think that that's ever going to totally replace our needs for buying produce. And produce is hard to get without going in and inspecting it yourself. You really have to trust your career. Do you ever do delivered groceries? I've never tried it. So here in Cincinnati, we are very fortunate that whenever any company rolls something out, they always roll it out in Cincinnati to compete with Kroger. So the two-hour Whole Foods free delivery that rolled out, we have that in Cincinnati. I don't, even, I don't think you guys have it in Columbus yet. They have it in Chicago now and New York and San Francisco and a couple other big markets. But it's amazing. You just set your two-hour window and you put everything in and it shows up on your doorstep in perfectly like packed bags and you never have to go to the grocery store. I mean, it's Instacart essentially, except without a fee, except just what you said, the produce, like you never get great produce. So if we're thinking about the opportunity here, market size is huge, we'll call it. Trying to back into some understanding of what things might look like now. They have a team of 20, if we want to assume call it $100,000 salary per, you have $2 million in salaries annually. Mm -hmm. What would you ballpark as something we could call an average contract value? All right, so that's $2 million in salaries, which helps us understand probably the bulk of their costs. Maybe there's, I don't know, throw another 500000 in there for office, data storage, whatever else that might come up that is a smaller portion. When we look at revenues, we didn't get an average contract value, but we did get one of their larger customers, which was $500,000. And they said that they could take up to a million dollars in contract value. What would you guess? I know we don't have this number, but what would you guess is kind of like maybe an average contract value, given that they're three months and not these yearly ones, and they had 92 of them. So it seems it'd be smaller to me. Just to play the math game out, let's say, let's say it's $50,000. Yeah. Let's do $50,000. That looks to me like it's, so that's $4.5 million of ARR on a cost basis of $2.6 million. And then, oh, we would need to pull out the... How'd you get to $4.5 million on a $50,000 contract? 90 customers in a year, average value, $50,000. That gets us to $4.5 million. Got it. 75% margin. Right, so... That gets us down to just make it easy, call it 3.5 million ish. And we got 2.5 million of cost. That gives them a profit of like a million dollars. So if you say that they've been making a million dollars for the last three years and they've raised $2 million, they have a good kind of cash position right now. Yeah. Well, he mentioned that their growth rate year on year for the last three years has been nearly doubling, doubling in bookings, revenue and team size. So they're obviously balancing team growth with revenue growth, determining, you know, how they 
one, probably have to support it, but two, how they want to add fuel on the fire. So if we're looking at the CPG industry as something that is in our massive bucket, you would presume that with this type of product market fit, they would want to pour on more money into people and growth, more direct sales, which is going to be expensive. So the question is, does Ad Adapted want to hire more to speed up growth? And will that outpace their revenue growth so they, they would need to raise? And you know what is the efficiency then of adding people versus revenue growth? Because if people growth has been doubling as revenue growth has been doubling, that doesn't seem to speak to an exponential return on investment. Right. As they increase people, they also need to increase that average contract size. And I don't know what that looks like. Does that mean they need to get into larger, bigger brands? Do they need to convince the same brands to be spending more with them? Could that be a, maybe not exponential, but a uptick on a, as you add new people? Or is it simply more people and this is going to be the contract size and it's a linear progression? I do believe that presuming that there's enough users they can advertise to, they can increase those contract sizes just because of the competitive advantage of being performance-based. It's not an offering that most CPG advertisers have in other places. So if I'm a CPG advertiser, I want to put more money into performance-based if it's approving to perform. It's just a question of, can I actually spend that much to get that much performance? Which again comes down to, can you get enough users? Can you get enough potentially publishers? Yeah, I would agree with that. I would also say that I have kind of a macroeconomic shadow in that I don't know what advertising budgets, what happens to advertising budgets and downturns. And to the extent we had a downturn, would advertisers kind of fall back on their laurels and say, okay, all of this experimental advertising we're doing, we just want to kind of pull that back and get into maybe the traditional bread and butter that we know works or Maybe we don't know works, but we think we've been doing it for so long that we can assume it works like career risk, essentially, right? If you're a brand manager and you go out on a limb and this thing works, that's great, but it's hard to go out on a limb and it doesn't work because you could have just stuck to what's normal and what everyone has been doing for a hundred years. That sucks if that's true because, I mean, I get it. I get that these CPG companies are huge and this is what they've been doing for a long time and so it's easier to go with the status quo in any case than to innovate, but the status quo is a black box that doesn't give you any real data of how that spend is going. And if you're doing performance-based, you should be able to actually see real results. So there should not, in my mind, be career risk there, but it's possible. I'm also thinking that probably a lot of these CPG companies that they're advertising with have some macroeconomic resiliency because they're probably more essentials type items. Their sales might, but their advertising budgets might not. It's been such a long time since we've had a recession. I kind of forget what it's like. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's going to be some budget. So if I'm tightening my budget, I'm going to put more money into what is performance based than what is, you know, brand advertisement. Fair. One thing that I would have liked to hear that I, I don't know if we did, if we asked the right question or what, but I would have liked to hear, okay, I advertise on this platform or I advertise with Ad Adapted. And because I advertise here, my RX bars are this much more likely to get added to a shopping cart and this much more likely to get purchased. Like what kind of research can be done there to give me some numbers behind that? Because I want to hear about the incremental improvement of what I'm currently getting or, and I don't even know how you measure that. I think it's a hard number to measure, but I would like to get something to give me a sense of magnitude for how effective this is. Yeah. And I tried to ask this. I'm still unsure. It it doesn't seem to me that this is an ROI that's proven to necessarily be more effective in getting more people to buy. It's more effective in measuring for sure. But is it actually resulting in more sales in aggregate? I don't know. I don't know how you could measure that because you can't measure the other way of doing it to give you a benchmark. Well, let's get to our six to 18 months. And I think that that might address what we're talking about here. So I'll go first. In six to 18 months, I want to see what discussions with retailers look like. I really think that there is a huge market here. If you can get all of the data that a Kroger or a Giant Eagle or a 
Whole Foods, I guess, with Amazon. And you could see, okay, this is the baseline. And now we can layer on, add adapted with what we're doing here. And we can see for this person, they used to only buy this, but once we put organic bananas in their basket, all of a sudden there was a shift and they started buying organic bananas and they never stopped because that was their new thing they added to their basket. Without that baseline, it is hard to say, okay, what is the incremental feedback? I also want to hear what retailers think about like having this platform, having this as a tool, not just the CPG brands. I'm looking at two things. I'm looking to see what does usage look like from the user side? Are there more users who are being targeted? We didn't get a term for that, but basically I want to see, are there more users who can be targeted by ads? Is that continuing to grow? And then secondarily, if that is true, how is their team growth looking? Because it seems like it is fairly labor intensive to do the direct sales. Seems like team growth is driving a lot of revenue growth. So how aggressively is ad adapted pursuing revenue growth through team growth? All right, guys, we'd love to hear what you think about this episode. Please tweet at us at Upside FM or email us hello at Upside.fm. If it's not painfully obvious through everything so far, we're pretty new to the CPG space. So if you can shed some light, please do so at Upside FM or hello at Upside.fm. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's guest. So shoot us an email at hello at Upside.fm or find us on Twitter at UpsideFM. We'll be back here next week at the same time talking to another founder in our quest to find upside outside of Silicon Valley. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please email us or find us on Twitter and let us know. And if you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes. That goes a long way in helping us spread the word and continue to help bring high quality guests to the show. Eric and I decided there were a couple things we wanted to share with you at the end of the podcast. And so here we go. Eric Hornung and Jay Klaus are the founding parties of the Upside Podcast. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or other financial interest in the companies which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of Duff and Phelps LLC and its affiliates, Unreal Collective LLC and its affiliates, or any entity which employ us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment advice on this show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week.